All right, I've got 8.30 on the clock, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Lee Lacey. I work for SORTEC here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, good morning and welcome to the best tutorial track for EdSec 2021. We've got three tutorials that you see here listed for today in this track. These three tutorials were selected by the tutorial board as recommended tutorials for the best tutorial award, which will be presented on Thursday night. So you should be able to access the slides from these on the portal if you have a full registration. And my understanding is they're gonna be videotaping each of these three and that they're gonna be up on YouTube and that there's a link downstairs to where you can find those. We've got a busy day ahead with the three tutorials. Uh, and then this late this afternoon, there's a event for the ETSIC Fellow 2021, which is Fred Hartman, who's a legend in the modeling simulation community, so that should be a good uh, activity as well. You'll also be receiving or have the ability to access survey forms, so we really appreciate your feedback so that we can use that information as we select tutorials for next year. So first up this morning is tutorial 2105, a comprehensive introduction to medical simulation. So the primary presenter is Dr. Roger Smith, and he's joined by Danielle Julian and Dr. Alyssa Tanaka. Roger is a well-known expert in modeling simulation for the medical domain. He's got over 25 years of experience creating leading edge simulators for DOD and the intelligence community. He's a senior scientist with SORTEC, working on AI applications to cyber and social media training simulation problems. Previously, he was the CTO of Advent Health's Nicholson Center, where they do their medical simulation work. When he was there, he performed research and education for robotic surgery systems and curricula. Before that, he served as the chief technology officer for PEO Stry here in Orlando, where he identified important new technologies that would be leveraged in future Army training systems. He was also the VP and CTO for the training systems part of Titan Corp and BTG prior to their acquisition by L3 and subsequently L3 Harris merger. His work there was primarily focused on, intelli on the intelligence community. Roger started his career performing operations research studies and developing software to support Lockheed Martin's F-16 program. He holds a PhD in computer science, master's in statistics, and a bachelor's in applied mathematics. He's also uh, published quite a few uh, books and book chapters, three textbooks on simulation, 17 book chapters, and over 100 journal and conference papers. His most recent book is Thinking About Innovation. He's received awards and recognition from the Army, NSA, ACM, Society for Computer Simulation, and AFCEA. His co-authors are Dr. Alyssa Tanaka, who also works for SORTEC. She's a recognized leader in medical modeling simulation and is leading some state-of-the-art research for organizations including DARPA. Her PhD and master's are both in modeling simulation. The third presenter is Danielle Julian. She's the director of education and research science at Advent Health Nicholson Center. Her current research focuses on robotic surgery simulation and effective surgeon training. Her current projects include intelligent tutoring systems, rapid prototyping of surgical education devices, and the evaluation of robotic simulation systems. She is a certified instructor for surgical robotics courses delivered to surgeons and OR staff members, and her background includes research in human factors and learning and training to enhance the higher order cognitive skills of military personnel. She's currently working on her PhD in modeling simulation and has a master's in modeling simulation as well. She has a uh, graduate simulation certificate in instructional design and a bachelor's in psychology. So those three presenters will be up first. So please join me in welcoming Roger to the stage. Thank you. Let's see if I can make this work. Hold tab, sorry. Say it again. Alt tab. Alt tab. Mm. That might have been control tab. Or just you got it. I got it. All right. So yesterday I was in my office at home and I was practicing my presentation 
And I kept going over by a couple of minutes. I was like, ah, oh, just over, just over. And I came out of my office and I said uh, to my wife, uh, so I've practiced about three times, and she said, how's it going? And I said, I'm just, I just need to be a little bit shorter. And she said, well, you could take your shoes off. <laughs> I swear, that, that did happen. I was like, what? Okay. Um, yeah, so we're going to kick off this uh, introduction to modeling simulation. I don't know if this works. It doesn't work. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about our learning objectives. So as we have done in the past, our goal here is to start at the bottom and work our way up through Bloom's taxonomy, uh, giving you a knowledge of the modifications of medical simulation that you would use in a military context, and then helping you to uh, comprehend a lot of the existing medical simulation systems and applying the, those tools on specific problems and then to analyze the benefits of medical simulation systems so that you can someday develop your own and also evaluate the effectiveness of those that are out there. So that's up and down the, the Bloom's taxonomy. Um, I wanted to start with a very short history of medical simulation because there's some really fascinating examples. And in medical simulation, it's very different than military simulation in that there are literally a couple of dozen books just on using simulation in medical education and training. Literally a couple dozen books. These are the covers of some of the ones that, I think I have most of these, and there are twice as many more. And there's one book that where the whole book is just about the history of the use of simulation in education in medicine. And I pulled out a couple of really great stories from that book um, and also from the internet. And so one of the stories I wanted to start with was how did the mannequin really get started as a disciplined tool um, in teaching medicine? And one of the earliest examples is this doll called the Josephine Chase doll. So Margaret Chase was a seamstress kind of person. She made dolls for children. And they were all cloth dolls like we would consider stuffed animals today. And she made them for these children, and then people started seeing them, and will you make them for me? And she kind of got into this little cottage industry of making dolls in her home, and then it developed into a workshop. Well, one of the administrators from a local hospital that had an education department for nurses saw these dolls and said, Josephine, no, not Josephine, Margaret, could you make some of these dolls that are life-size? Because we want to train these nurses on how to take a patient and how do, you, how do you change their clothes? How do you rotate them so you can change the bedding? How do you transfer them from a bed to a gurney? All those kinds of things. And we, we don't have a good mock-up. Um, they actually did have some that were like uh, scarecrows. They were clothes stuffed, stuffed with straw, and they didn't like those. And so she made this first life-size doll, and she called it Josephine. And they liked these so well because the, the body is made out of cloth and stuffed with cotton but the head is a ceramic kind of thing with raised nose and features, and then they hand-painted the eyes and, and the eyebrows and the hair on Josephine was the name of the first doll they delivered. So on Josephine, and that became the Josephine Chase doll. And so th these nurses started using Josephine, Josephine in place of essentially a scarecrow, and that kind of started the business. And suddenly, instead of making stuffed animals for the local children, she's making medical mannequins uh, for hospitals. And she branches out, and by 1921, 10 years later, uh, this ad appears for the Josephine Chase Company, where she offers many different models of Josephine. So there's not just the Josephine full of cotton, there's also children Josephines, and there's Josephines that have internal plumbing that you can fill with liquid. And they have pipes for the three main orifices, so you can either put water in or take water out, depending on what you want to do. And so you could order what you wanted. And Josephine, uh, I noticed that she says she's uh, trademarked her stockinette doll. So that was a fascinating beginning of mannequins in 1911 and going to 1921. OK, another story along those same lines that at first appears not to be simulation based. So in, uh, 19, no, in 1880, there was a young girl in Paris who drowned in the Seine River. And she was anonymous. Nobody came forward to say, that's my daughter, that's my niece. And the newspapers thought it was a tragedy that this beautiful young girl died and that she was totally unknown. So maybe her family doesn't know what happened to her. She's just unclaimed. 
Um, and there were a lot of news stories about that in the papers and how sad it was. Well, while she was in the morgue, somebody snuck into the morgue and did a plaster cast of her dead face. That's the plaster cast of her dead face. And then they started making um, molds up from that cast and selling those faces to art schools. So this is Paris in 1880, lots of art schools around Paris, and they would buy these plaster casts to use as live, not live, models to teach people how to draw the, the human face. And there's a picture, a uh, classic picture of somebody doing that in an art studio in Paris. So at first it was just the art studios that bought these, but then they caught on as objects of art that would be desirable to hang in your home. And so the richer people around Paris would have these hanging in their living room or in their parlors, and it was a thing that you should have this uh, in your house. And so there were hundreds or maybe thousands of these uh, sold around Paris and Europe, and they were used as uh, art objects on the wall instead of just uh, art modeling equipment. So what does that have to do with simulation? Well, nothing yet. So this is a very popular thing in Europe around 1900. Then, in 1960-ish, there was a toy maker who was very good at working with soft plastics, and the government came to him and said, you're very good at um, working with soft plastic. We would like you to make a mannequin for us, and we would like that mannequin to be used to teach this new mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation technique that's just now being understood. And he said, sure, I can do that. I can add that onto my toy business. His name was Asman Laerdal. And so the entire Laerdal business started when he pivoted from making toys to making mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation dolls. And when he made his first doll, he needed a face to put on that doll. What face do you think he used? He used the model of this young girl that died in the Seine 80 years before. So the first Recessa Andy had the face of that drowned girl from 1880. Uh, another mannequin. I found those two, the more I read about those stories, the more fascinating they became. All right, if you look at artwork from hundreds of years ago, let's say from 1600, you'll find demonstrations of surgeons teaching other surgeons how to do uh, dissection, how the anatomy works, and doing that with cadavers. And if you look at the caption on the one on the left, you'll notice that this one is by Rembrandt. Rembrandt, not just anybody but even Rembrandt went to these classes to watch it, this happen and to capture this in his artwork. And it's that painting is a classic Rembrandt in that the face of the surgeon is highlighted so it jumps out at you a little more. He, the thing he wants you to notice the most is brighter and more vivid in the, in the picture. And then the faces of the other surgeons watching are a little more diminished, except for where his light, the light of the teaching surgeon, reflects off the faces of the two closest ones. Okay, so that's one, that's using uh, cadavers for teaching, which we still do 400 years later and which they did 400 years before this. And then the other painting is from the 1800s showing the same kind of teaching happening, only happening on a dog instead of a cadaver. And if you read the caption carefully, you'll know that that dog is uh, alive and awake, unfortunately. And he was trying to show how, what an agonizing experience that was for the dog to be operated on while uh, they were teaching him to take out the liver or whatever. All right. Now, if we move to something more mechanical, this isn't the first mechanical simulation, but it's one that I thought was fascinating from that book on the history. Um, Benjamin Hoadley wanted to teach people how the breathing system works. So back in 1740, and even up till much more recently, there was this thought that how, does, how do your lungs work? Well, your lungs are muscles and the lungs pull and push the air in and out of your lungs, which is exactly what they don't do. They're very passive bags that hang in your chest and that are activated by the diaphragm creating pressure um, in and out of your chest area. And that's what he wanted to show with this model. So he created an airproof box and put a bag in there that represents the lung with a valve on the top, which represents the throat, things coming in and out. And so when you squeeze on that bag that hangs below, the air below goes into the upper box, creates a pressure and squeezes the air out of the lungs. And when you let go, 
it sucks the air back into a bigger space and it, in, it inhales. And that was his whole uh, point was to say this is how the breathing apparatus works, but he didn't have the materials to make the diaphragm out of an elastic rubber thing or chose not to, uh, but he used a bag instead of that elastic um, diaphragm. So that's an early mechanical simulator used to teach people how breathing works. And then here's, to, as far as we know, uh, the first mannequin-based computer-operated uh, human patient simulator. Uh, it's a project called Sim1 that was paid for by the Department of Education in 1967. And if you look at the contraptions here, you'll recognize that all the pieces look pretty much the same as human patient simulators today. It's just the dials and gauges, instead of being physical, are now digital dials and gauges and things. But this mannequin, even in 1967, um, it could breathe, it had a heartbeat, it had fluid in its arms so that it had a pulse and blood pressure, and it had blinking eyes. So it didn't have dilating eyes, but the eyelids would go up and down. And it, took a, it would give a physiological response to drugs. And if you know how the mannequins respond to drugs today, it was roughly the same thing back then. If you don't know, you'll have to read the notes. All right, virtual reality didn't come into medical simulation very early because surgery especially, which is where all the money is, which is where you get the money to buy simulators, um, surgery has always been a very hands-on, touchy, face-in-the-weeds in the kind of, of operation. So the, the physician went in and touched things and moved things, very tactile. Uh, but when minimally invasive surgery became popular around 1985, suddenly you had this di disintermediation between the surgeon's hands and the organs being operated on. So with minimally invasive surgery, you in insert a long stick that has a camera and two sticks that have instruments, and you're operating from outside the body while the instruments and camera are inside the body, and you can't see them, you have to look at a TV monitor. Well, somebody said, you know what? You're looking at a TV monitor anyway. I could create a 3D representation and you could operate in 3D and that would be a virtual kind of trainer. And the, the first exercises in, you know, 19, most of us can't even remember how crude computers were in 1995, but they were just these boxes and bars and balls and things that you manipulated and pretended to cut and pretended to take apart and things. And then later they started adding the background that looked like a surgical field. So that happened around 1995. And MistVR was an ongoing product up until 2010-ish, around that time. It just kept improving. The, the, the other pictures are from later versions around 2010, 2015. So that's a quick history of, uh, of medical simulation. So in we, we built this uh, section of the tutorial last year during COVID. And what we noticed was that we went from having absolutely no medical training material on COVID to having lots of options really, really quickly. I am an avid user of the Coursera system and I noticed on Coursera, suddenly there were like a dozen courses from very reputable places like Stanford, Johns Hopkins, University of Florida, University of Houston, um, offering this curriculum for free. So you could just sign up and start taking all these courses uh, that had been created or modified from other respiratory uh, programs. So those became available almost instantly. Um, a couple of the simulator manufacturers that you might see um, on the show floor here did the same thing. So ARA Virtual Heroes, they didn't have anything specific on COVID, but they had a course that was about how to treat people that are having respiratory problems, how to intubate them and how to help them with their breathing. And so they put that course previously, a, a must purchase item, up for free on their website. And they had another one on how to do uh, <coughs> lab testing that they put up on their course for, on their website for free. And then SimX, they modified some of the existing content they had to make it COVID specific and put those materials up on their website for free. So suddenly all this stuff is becoming available uh, for free because there's a crisis in the world. I noticed this, uh, with the first instance that I saw of um, live training happening in hospitals 
was in this um, hospital in Ottawa, which started training their people on how to handle COVID patients before COVID ever arrived at the US or Canada. It was still only in Italy and they, everybody was thinking it's going to be everywhere, so we better train now because when it gets here, we won't have time to train. And so every hospital and airlines and government agencies and elder care facilities started teaching their people, uh, usually by modifying curriculum that they already had for SARS and MERS and previous outbreaks like that. And then a couple of the mannequin makers, CAE and Laerdal, um, both of them had thousands of mannequins and software products in the field with their customers. And they didn't update those, but they sent out curriculum saying, given the, the software and hardware you already have, here's how you would run a training course around COVID. Here's how you would do the isolation and how you would treat the patient. And you could use the equipment you already had without having to update it at the time. So that was the, the world's response to COVID really quickly. Um, I wanna talk about some taxonomies of simulation as well. I know I'm jumping from category to category, bang, bang, bang. Um, in, in military simulation, we've been using the terms live virtual constructive for about 30 years, uh, 34 years. Since General Paul Gorman gave a presentation in 1991 where he kind of emphasized that all of our simulations fall into live, virtual, and constructive. And then later we added games, and so it became plus G for a long time, or LBCG now. Well, the m medical community has looked at that and said, that's a good start, but that's not really how our domain is shaped. We're a little different than that. And so they've been wrestling with that same, how do we create such a simple taxonomy uh, for a couple decades already. Uh, Richard Satava, who's a very famous surgeon in this space, he envisioned uh, a taxonomy as a progression of complexity. So you start with something that's very simple and you progress to something that's much more complex. That aligns really well with the learning theory that you're going to see in medical simulation in a later section. But he said, you know, there's simple things where all you have to do is learn how to place um, a, a blood draw or to put a, a IV into an arm, and that, that's all there is, is something like an arm. And then you progress to where you have more of the, the body and you're able to use equipment against that body, and so that's a more simple manipulation of the ultrasound one, for example. And then you get into more complex things like teaching people to do an anastomosis, which is to sew two ends of a vessel together, um, which is a, a nice skill and a difficult skill, but it's not a whole surgery. And then the final step in his taxonomy was you have a full surgery like a hysterectomy and your simulation or your virtual reality uh, represents all the steps that you would perform in a hysterectomy. So that's useful, but it's very specific to surgery, maybe not generalizable across all of medicine. Um, three years ago, uh, we, our, our, these authors actually proposed another taxonomy where it said, you know, there's a, this whole class of simulators or simulation that are based on biology. So that's where you use a cadaver, you use an animal, or you use a human patient, or your uh, humans are the team that come together around a uh, training experience. And then there's a set of them that are mechanical, which would be like a human patient simulator, a white box trainer, or a part task trainer, where it's a physical thing that you, you carry around and you touch. And then there's the virtual version, which is 3D inside the computer and maybe game-based. So that's an, another possible taxonomy. And then the one that I actually like the best uh, was this one by Gina Chinera, where she said, you know, it seems to me like all of our training either involves a part task trainer, like an arm in this picture here, or a standardized patient, which you see a lot in medical schools where the patient comes in and pr pretends to be sick, or a human patient simulator, which may or may not be a whole person laying on the table, a, a whole rubber person, and then there's virtual reality. So those four kind of categorize the devices we use, but in practice, we're, we usually combine two of those or three of those uh, to create a curriculum. We usually don't limit ourselves to just using one. And so I think that taxonomy comes closest to do, doing what LVCG does for the military. All right. 
Now, I mentioned learning theory. Moving on to learning theory, um, Richard Satava was borrowing from this uh, model of learning in medical simulation. It's not unique only to medical, but in medicine, when you want to learn how to do something, usually first you go to didactic courses, either in person or online. You, you take uh, the courses, you take your tests, you move on, you show you have some knowledge. And then they give you a partial task trainer, which might just be a throat to intubate, or might just be an arm to put an IV in. And then they'll give you a whole human patient simulator. And then they'll let you work with a team. And so your, your, the, the skill you're learning is how to interact with all of the team. Now that a little bit blurs the fact that somewhere between human patient simulator and team training, you also end up with uh, training on cadavers and animals. And they prefer to use an experiential learning cycle rather than something that's more didactic and pushing. They, they prefer to bring the, pa the surgeons, the trainees in, and have them express what they already know and what they already believe is the right way to do something and get 10 people in a course expressing that and sharing that, including the instructor, and you can see how those things are not all the same. They can bounce that, their ideas off of each other and discover what works the best, as opposed to the sage on the stage ordering everybody, this is the way it'll be done. You want them to experience how other people's ideas, prefer, and hopefully the instructors, are superior to theirs and they should adopt those. And the, the idea is if you do it that way, you'll remember it more and more likely to put it into practice once you leave the course. Uh, I mentioned Bloom's taxonomy. I don't have anything new to say about Bloom's taxonomy there, except that um, in medicine, there's a different taxonomy that clearly was derived from Bloom. Um, the pyramid side is the same, going from knowing how to do it to actually doing it, but the back dimension is a measure or an assessment of A, how much do you know? B, how much can you demonstrate and, and show with your hands? And C, what is your attitude about it? Do you have the right caring attitude about trying to take care of the patient and help them with their patient, their, uh, their families? And so those, that back dimension is, um, is not usually found in Bloom's taxonomy. <laughs> All right, now this is the part where I take my shoes off because I'm getting a little long, and so I'm gonna go really quickly over this section of slides. We were asked in a previous presentation, where's your constructive equivalent? And there's not a direct constructive equivalent. Here's what we have in healthcare. Um, this is a command center for the Advent Health System here in Orlando. There are about 12 Advent Health hospitals in Orlando, and dozens of emergency rooms and walk-in clinics and all of those are tied together into this command center. And the, somebody sitting at one of these command stations would be assigned to monitor, let's say, the throughput that's going through every ER in Orlando right now. And so if you wanted to know um, where you should send a nurse or a doctor, you, this person would know where there were more patients than there were providers. Or if you're an ambulance driver and you wanted to know where there was capacity, this person could tell the ambulance, you know, there's more um, unused capacity at this campus than at this campus, so take the patient there right now. Uh, and each one of those people monitors a different part of the system. And so for the first time, the hospital knows uh, what's happening across a family of 12 different campuses and care centers and all those other things. <laughs> And if you, want to, if you train these people, this is kind of a constructive training environment. If you say, I'm, you're here on a new station, I'm gonna let you play with the data from last month, and we're gonna teach you how to do your job based on last month's data. Uh, this is a discrete event simulation of a very large emergency room where you can experiment with the physical layout of the facility, how many clinical staff you need, need how many administrative staff you need, and what happens to that facility when the patient inflow fluxes up and down. And then there's a whole bunch of data tracking. How many of you uh, visited this website in the last two years? How many, during the lockdown, were we looking at it every day? Right. That's not a simulation per se, but that is millions and millions of data points that will drive simulations from now for, for decades on, how pandemic spreads. 
Um, and then there were simple agent-based simulations being developed. Uh, this one had no geographic uh, specific. And then a later version added locations where people lived, worked, shopped, and went to the hospital. And then tried to shut down some of those and see what it did to um, the spread of the disease. And the CDC on their website had this constant stream of the models they were using to track the disease. And they were, they were actually combining dozens of models, just like the hurricanes do. You see the tracks for half a dozen hurricane models. They were using about two dozen academic models. All right. Military specific simulation. Um, and, and if you look at military specific simulation, you'll find that the front end has a lot of development and the back end has very little development. That's because in the front end, when you're at the point of injury, the things that are happening are very unique to the military. But when you get to the back end, once you're in a hospital environment, um, it's very similar to the civilian population. And so the training that exists for the civilian population works just as well in a military um, hospital training as well. And that's why you see things like these uh, mystic training centers focusing on treating a, a soul injured soldier on the battlefield. And you see these games focusing on that same uh, tactical combat casualty care environment. Um, and I put these two older pictures side by side to emphasize that it's not just the US, but, the, but France has that same mentality about what do we need to train soldiers on that they wouldn't learn um, in a civilian environment. And then you can see uh, advances in the graphics, advances in the haptics, which you can, when you go down on the show floor, I think this is an ECS product, and I, I can't remember the name of the haptic company, but they'll be down there on the show floor later. Okay, so I wanna turn it over to Danielle. Um, I'm one, I went one minute less. Must, I must have taken off only one sheet. All right. <laughs> I'm going to pre-apologize. I have some allergy stuff going on, so if I <laughs> sniffle during this, I uh, apologize. I do not have COVID. It's a bad time to have allergies, huh? <laughs> uh, thanks, Roger. So Roger explained the history of simulation all the way to uh, military use. Uh, the rest of the tutorial will cover, and he touched on most of these, but it'll cover specifics for simulating external care and internal care. Um, so standardized patients, he, uh, Roger mentioned this, they're specialists trained to portray scenarios for the instruction and assessment of clinical skills. Um, we use these because they do offer that standardization. So I can do the same training over and over with the same actor and get the same scenario. Um, but most importantly, not only does it help with critical thinking, uh, patient safety, crisis management, communication skills, but it's one of the only simulation uh, devices that enter the emotional part. So whether the standardized patient is acting as the patient and you're getting an automatic feedback from them or the emotional feedback, they can act as also act as a concerned family member. So how do I approach that? So it's more of an all-encompassing simulation. Um, <clears throat> okay, sorry, this kind of threw me off because it's skipped. It's different than what I was used to. Okay, so the hybrid simulators, um, on one of the slides we're gonna talk about part task trainers, and again, Roger mentioned this, but the hybrid simulators bring two of those simulation devices together, the human that's giving you that emotional part, and then that mechanical hardware that I can reuse. So here you see two examples of birthing simulations. So you're getting all the screaming, sweating, yelling of the mother, but you're also handling the actual um, mechanical process of the delivering of birth with that part task trainer. And these task trainers are models that represent um, a speci specific anatomical part. They're usually focused on one or two tasks. And these tasks are pretty simple. Um, and it's just trying to get those steps associated with it down. So more muscle memory. Um, so these will be used for something like placing a tourniquet or where to extract or how to place a needle for extracting blood. Uh, some of these devices do have mechanical or electronical feedback. Um, to help the learners with those procedural skills, but most of them are pretty basic. 
These simulators provide the learner to practice that skill in a deliberate and repetitive manner, and they're portable, they're less resource exhaustive and less expensive than the standardized patients. Uh, the issue with these types is that there's little to no environmental stimulation. So pairing them with that standardized patient allows us to incorporate that um, environmental <clears throat> stimulation. And as we go through these slides, you'll learn how important that is in the medical field. Um, Roger also touched on this. A high fidelity simulator provides a somewhat hybrid between those standardized patients and the part task trainers. The patient's not real itself, but they do provide realistic feedback and react to or stimuli, uh, meaning that the man mannequin can breathe, cry, make noise, vomit if it needs to, but it can also react to things like CPR or um, the introduction of any kind of drug. This technique is less resource exhaustive than the standardized patient. We don't have to train an actor or hire an actor to do so. However, we still have to have a human in the loop because they're running all of the simulation behind the scenes. Um, they can provide learners with both objective feedback and the simulated responses to intervention. So if we're doing CPR on the, the mannequin, then I can tell you how deep your compressions were, what your time was at, um, but it also gives me responses to simulations like, did I select the right drug? Screen-based virtual reality simulations um, often in the medical world are used to um, train procedural or protocol knowledge. We don't really use them a lot for surgical or hands-on stuff because you really need to, again, it's that psychomotor skills development. Um, these are great because they require little support and can often be ran um, solo without a proctor. Um, but again, they're not ideal for psychomotor skills like surgical skills or those needle insertion or tourniquet placements. Team trainings. So team trainings help the learners to progress that knowledge that they learned in those separate scenarios, utilizing those separate simulations, um, and bring it into practice in a realistic space. These trainings are built to represent the stressful, high-paced environment where the learned skills through all of those other simulations will actually be applied. In medicine, you're only as strong as your weakest team member, and you rely on a team throughout your whole career. You will hardly ever be doing anything individually or solo. Um, so there's gonna be multiple opinions, multiple hands, multiple jobs to be completed simultaneously. So we do these team trainings so that it allows those to practice their roles, but also to learn and understand what other roles are happening in the OR, ER. Um, team training helps the healthcare to progress from a knowledge assessment and discipline-based task to a multidisciplinary and system-based training, um, all with the ultimate goal of ensuring patient safety. But to help foster this teamwork and communication, we, several teamwork standards had to be developed because um, historically, there's been a hierarchy, and I still, I say historically, but I think it's still there. There's a hierarchy in the ER, the OR, or a medical event where the most trained or the most educated are the ones that call the shots, and those under it are just not comfortable communicating their uh, feelings or what they think needs to be done. So standards like these two have been created to help break down those walls and facilitate better communication across the team. Um, for example, if it's at the end of a procedure, the, uh, the nurse, scrub nurse needs to feel comfortable saying that the needle count is off, and how do I approach my surgeon in the right way to do that? Surgical simulation. So currently, sim uh, surgery is being completed through one of two modalities, laparotomy or open, where the surgeon are using their hands and their instruments directly inside the patient. They're visually seeing the anatomy face to anatomy, basically. And then laparoscopic or keyhole surgery, which is the newer of the two, where um, there are small incisions and longer instrumentations outside of the patient's body. And now they're looking at the anatomy through a 2D screen. So it's much different than traditional surgery. And as of more recently, around year 2000s, the introduction of robotics, which has gained um, and that is where they're manipulating those long instruments, but now they're not even standing patient side. They're at a separate console manipulating those, and now they're looking at the uh, anatomy in a 3D view. 
Open surgery simulation really hasn't advanced past those history slides that Roger talked about. We are still using cadaveric dissection as our number one training in surgery. Um, it's better than on the patient, so it's often the go-to for open simulation. Um, behind that, you have the animate side, so this is still being used. Now, the animals, thankfully, aren't alive and <laughs> squirming in the, like that picture portrayed, but it gives us the only simulation that allows us to work on a live patient to make sure that the outcome was successful. On a cadaver, I can do the surgery. How do I know if it was successful or not? Um, bench models are essentially the equivalent of those part task trainers for surgery. It's just one or two tasks. It's not the entire procedure, and it's in one, like a specific anatomy. And for VR, there are some. They're not great, and most of them focus in the ortho or the spine area for surgery. And again, that's just because surgery is so hands-on and it's such a psychomotor skills. Uh, you need so many psychomotor skills that VR doesn't allow for that. On the, con, on, the, uh, on the other side, <laughs> laparoscopic simulation tends to be almost all computer-based or graphic simulation approach. Um, that's because in the actual laparoscopic world, you're looking at a 2D monitor already, and so it just makes sense to slip a computer-simulated <laughs> graphic in between. There is a large number and a wide variety of simulations in this space. There are larger stand-up models, like you see here, um, that have dozens or maybe hundreds of exercises. Uh, these exercises are typically one or two skill based at a time. They're not really procedural exercises. We're very behind in that. Um, or there's these white box trainers that are super simple. It's a completely physical simulation. You can use a tablet or an iPhone and place some kind of tissue underneath to practice those laparoscopic, laparoscopic skills. Um, for those types of trainers, we usually slip in something like a silicone plastic model, excise animal tissue, ca cadaveric tissue can go there, or just simple games to develop dexterity. Whether the surgeon's training for open, lap, or robotic, there are several dry lab simulations built to train specific skills that we rely on and use very heavily. Um, these are extremely inexpensive. I mean, as much as anything in healthcare, I mean, I think a plastic model is still $400, but um, they allow for repeat practice and they're low resource and can aid in training essential surgical skills like suturing, like the middle one, dexterity, uh, the end one there, and grasping, retracting, those types of. Now there are more advanced dry lab surgical skills trainers that aim to train multiple of those skills all located in one device. So the dome one here trains over 16 psychomotor skills through seven exercises. Uh, they're reusable and affordable. Uh, the dome-shaped one was developed specifically for robotic surgeons but have been used for both app open and lap training. Um, and then the flat one was developed for laparoscopic surgeons but can also be used for either and it just takes 16 different psychomotor skills and places them all on one device. And then something that we use often before we go to that run stage of training where we're in a simulated OR with cadaveric tissue or a live patient, porcine patient or animate patient, we'll use um, anything wet. So we use things like turkey thighs, we can use excise porcine bowel, we can use cadaver pieces just to give them that that step of feeling real tissue. So practicing on those plastic models are great, um, but you then have to transition to what it feels like to suture on regular anatomy or real anatomy. Um, and these trainers are one of the only ones that allow the surgeon to practice cauterization or the use of energy. So VR doesn't have a good um, application for that. All of those plastic models don't have a good application for that. So you're gonna have to bring it back to something simple like a turkey thigh. The Da Vinci robot is an extremely augmented version of laparoscopic surgery. Um, the platforms themselves are about two to $2.5 million a piece. Um, so often training on one is extremely limited. So this has generated a market for standalone simulators that can be pre uh, purchased at a lower price point. So these usually run about 100,000. Uh, so to date, there are four different types of simulators for the Da Vinci. 
uh, and they all compete for customers based on their unique physical configurations and their cap capabilities, so the different exercises that are programmed into them. Um, I, these um, other surgical robots have become to uh, appear on the market, and eventually they'll have to have something like this as well, because uh, again, the robot's going to be so expensive that use to it is going to be limited, um, but also because the FDA's insistence on a progressive, objective, and measurable training program for any robotic platform that tries to get FDA approval. <clears throat> they also allow surgeons and surgeons in training to practice these exercises without a proctor. And each simulator provides the user with an assessment of each exercise, scoring critical things like blood loss, excessive force of my instrument, um, and then efficiency things like how quick was the exercise complete um, and how, how much did I move my instruments during that procedure. So this was supposed to be a video, but every year we have issues uploading it. So um, it was a short clip of a specific VR simulator, uh, the Robotics Mentor. And I chose it because it's one of the few that have procedural uh, exercises, like Roger said. To date, most of the exercises for robotics or laparoscopic are all dexterity-based, one skill at a time. There are very little that do a procedure from start to finish. Um, and while the initial simulation of uh, or the uh, a view of this looks great as the video progressed, which doesn't work, um, it showed all of the glitches in the software. I mean, it's hard to simulate anatomy when I don't know how each anatomy acts differently. So how can I simulate it in a VR? So you could just see if you cut, it didn't split quite like tissue. When you retract, it doesn't retract quite like the real thing. Okay, so certification. Currently, there are no, there are zero globally accepted standards for that comprehensively describe a simulation education center, a medical simulation education center, or a medical simulation educator. There's not a one size fit all, but several societies have outlined benchmarks for creating a credible simulation program. Um, I just wanted to share this so that, you know, if anybody's interested in creating a program, you can start using these guidelines before the program is created. Um, the, specifically, the ones that I looked at were American College of Surgeons, Society for Simulation and Healthcare, American College for, or Society for Anesthesiologists, and American College for Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, so why accredit? Mainly because your simulation program can benefit because it gives external validation. Um, it increases, can increase your client base, improve funding, and the ability to attract collaborators. There are four main categories that each of these societies outline as, um, as important, and it's really no surprise. You want to have a well-developed uh, curriculum and assessment, the appropriate instructor and supporting personnel, the simulation equipment and technology, and an infrastructure that will continuously support the program, like a hospital, a larger hospital system or a medical school. Um, but each of these societies mentioned will show, I'll show you on the next slide, they put their efforts and focuses on different areas of these four. So here's an example of where the societies focus heavily on and where, than others. The red indicates where the emphasis of accreditation is in the areas of society, societies that are strongly different. I should be able to look at this chart and find where my program lies if I'm going to create one. So at the Advent Health Nicholson Center, we actually went through this accreditation process. So I was able to look that, you know, I have a research component, I have a large infrastructure, and I want to train more than OBGYNs or anesthesiologists, so the best fit for us was the American College of Surgeons certification. And then, of course, before you can decide to develop your accreditation program, you have to choose the accreditation that um, is going to consider the end users. So uh, the the institutes mentioned before divided into either broad or specialty specific. Um, so you want to make sure that you're choosing one that will train the learners that you're going to have within your building. So again, I went with ACS because it spanned a large, um, it was more generalized and less specific. So I th think now it will go to Alyssa, Dr. Tanaka. I am not going to try that when I go down. 
Um, all right, so the next ses section of this tutorial will focus on the use of artificial intelligence in medical training and education, specifically in, med in training and education. Um, AI is being leveraged into healthcare for a variety of uses, ranging from clinical decision support, um, patient documentation. Um, AI can have benefits such as providing faster and potentially more accurate diagnoses. Um, it can also help reduce error due to human fatigue, something that I think we'll see a lot more of, right, with um, the shortages in healthcare providers, specifically nurses, burnout, all of those kinds of things due to COVID. Um, it can also decrease medical costs and ideally reduce mortality rates. That's the, the end, the, the real end goal, right, of, of everything that we're doing in healthcare. Our discussion around AI will focus specifically on training applications, as I mentioned. Um, and first, we will discuss three specific AI applications that we can see today or that are being used right now for medical training. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about challenges and some considerations um, for integrating AI into, med into the medical training domain. I'm actually going to move this a little bit. All right, so the first application that we want to discuss is AI-generated training content. Um, and so the general idea here is to use real world data to train an AI model and to then use that model to generate new and relevant examples. So these generated examples can then be used for educational content that might be embedded into training applications or can be used to further train and refine the AI models that are underlying um, the systems being used. So if we look at the example that's on the screen, let's talk about this for a second. So generative adversarial networks or GANs have been used more famously for lots of different tools, right? Um, to teach a, tr a computer to play a video game, or um, Roger uh, mentioned that apparently it's, it can be used to generate a picture in the style, like a Van Gogh style, take your picture and, and turn it into sort of a Van Gogh style, something called style GAN. Um, so turn it into the style of a known artist. Um, but they've also been used to generate medical imagery that can be used for training. So you can see some examples there, right? Um, so using a set of real scans, so for example, x-ray, CT, ultrasound, the GAN can create other images in that same kind of style. The GAN has a learning phase also um, that generates many images, some of which may actually be pretty poor approximations of the original. But eventually, it uses all of those images and it'll teach itself um, which images are the most like the original. So then it'll have a large uh, repository, right, of originals as well as images that are very close or, or representative of that original image. Um, and so the best of all of those images are extracted and kind of pooled together, right, to use for teaching. For teaching, excuse me. <clears throat> So this approach can be used um, to develop an abundant amount of content that might be needed, right, to train a specific condition. Um, so for example, tumor identification, I think that's actually what this, uh, what this example uh, points to. So for example, tumor identification. Um, so, and this, and this can also be used, right, the, a big benefit of this, right, so it can generate a bunch of images, right, to find the tumor or to find a specific condition. But more specifically, this is sort of interesting, right, because it can help to create data um, and content for conditions that might be more rare, right? So maybe you don't have a lot of examples because it doesn't occur frequently. And those are the conditions that we really want to have the opportunity to build models around to ultimately train our providers to identify and to experience, right? And so we can generate all of that content using this kind of approach. Um, so this approach has a few advantages and disadvantages, obviously, just like anything. Um, so given a small number, some advantages are that given a small number of images with a specific pathology, like the tumor that you see here, the GAN can create many more images that possess those same tumors, that, but those may be in different locations, different sizes, or different structures, right? So the training set has a lot more variety without actually requiring the collection of that variety. Um, the collection of that from real patients might be time consuming, it might be challenging, resource intensive, it might be impossible, right? If you don't have that large number of patients that have that condition like we talked about, right, with a rare condition or something like that, it might actually be impossible to generate or to acquire that large amount of uh, data representative of that. And so that's a, obviously the, the, the largest benefit to this approach. Also, the GAN images are not from a real person. Um, so in, by their nature, they're free of HIPAA uh, regulations. And so sharing them and using them for training and other things is, is a lot easier, right? Because you don't have the sensitive patient data because um, it's not a real person. 
So some disadvantage, uh, some disadvantages of the GANs um, are that, uh, so one, the GANs generate, might generate, um, some pretty poor copies of the good image, right? And so a human might need to go through, sort through all of those images and say, okay, this is not actually, this is not right, this is, this is good, this is not. Um, so they have to sort through all of those images that are created and eliminate all of the ones that are not quite good enough to train the models and to use for training. Um, also, so the GANs rely on the style of an original. So as the image technology and the quality of the, of the images improve, the, algor the algorithms have to be retrained to match those, uh, to generate images and to match that new level of quality. Um, so this is just one example of generating training AI content that is currently being used and, um, and you can check out the publication on. Uh, but there are many other relevant applications for using AI to generate training content. Um, similar approaches have been described and can be used to create large realistic data sets to enhance things like a patient physiology model, right? The patient physiology models that underline like TC3 sim that Roger had brought up before. Um, so, so data can be used or this approach can be used to generate large data sets that can create more realistic patient physiology models or again to create uh, individual more specific like a COVID, a COVID patient model or something like that that might be a little bit more interesting or um, not, as, not seen as often and we don't have as much data on. So the next application that we're going to talk about is AI augmented, augmented reality, which is a tongue twister um, as I'm saying it out loud. Um, but I'm sure most of us are familiar with AR systems like the Microsoft HoloLens. I'm sure that we'll see a lot of them out on the show floor. Um, uh, but so, you know, systems like the Microsoft HoloLens that project virtual overlays into the real world scene. Um, so generally speaking, these overlays can provide visual stimuli um, to the trainee for increasing training realism, um, providing a mechanism for them to interact with the environment, um, and just to provide general cues to the learner um, that might need a little bit of help, right, to point them in the right direction. So using AI, um, so using AI, augmented reality can provide these cues in a more realistic and meaningful way, right? So you're, you know, it's taking the already uh, enhanced augmented uh, overlays and providing a little bit more um, intelligence on the, on the backside to help provide that in a meaningful way. Um, so AI can specifically help with this by processing both the real image received from the live camera um, and the previously stored image. Using this information, it can automatically add annotations or graphic indicators, like I had mentioned before, those cues, suggesting the, the best placement, for example, of screws, um, avenues for approach, or showing them where specific anatomical pieces are um, that, that, they, that the learner should be uh, paying attention to or potentially avoiding, right, when they're, when they're performing a procedure or training a procedure. And so if we look at the example that's up on the screen um, on the bottom of the slide, so that shows a surgeon uh, performing an orthopedic leg reconstruction. Um, and so you can see kind of that virtual overlay um, that's based on actually preoperative scans of that exact patient. Um, and so it shows the patient's internal anatomy as well as some of the traumatic injuries that the, that the surgeon is looking to, looking to address. Um, so you can see that the letter D there um, the letter D, which is kind of small, it's on the left, and with the green, uh, with the green arrows. So the letter green, in the, with the letter green, the AI has identified automatically that there's vasculature there, right? Um, and that's identified the, those structures that need to be avoided during the surgery. Whereas letter D, the AI in this application has actually identified fractures that do need to be addressed by the provider. And so it's doing all of that automatically with some image recognition based on the actual scans from preoperative stage from a preoperative phase and overlaying that onto the patient in real time. So this can definitely be helpful for the surgeon, obviously, right? Um, it can help the surgeon to better visualize his patient's injuries during the surgery, but this can be an incredibly valuable resource for a resident, for example, um, so that they can, uh, you know, observe what's happening in real time in the OR, um, but they can have explicit and anatomically relevant cues that they can observe and learn as the procedure progresses. Um, or potentially, this is obviously a, a super valuable uh, telementoring aid that they can actually use in real time to, to perform the procedure, right? If we're thinking about that, um, that kind of scale of observing um, and explaining and then doing, they can kind of walk through that uh, using this aid.
So another application um, that we're going to talk about is um, the in is intelligent speech understanding. And so I think you know speech recognition is a very prominent uh, piece of everyday life for all of us right now. I think if I said, uh, hey Siri, probably all of our phones would light up or, oh, my, uh, my iPad actually just lit up as I said it, right? And so, um, you know, it's very prominent in everyday life. Um, we're all used to being able to say that um, and have just about anything shown to us or at least a semi-close Google search brought up. Um, and so the same concept is being applied to the medical domain and can be seen in several different applications. Um, so this you know, speech understanding is used to enhance specifically, and specifically in the application I'm going to talk about, the interactivity between humans and the simulated patients, um, whether that be a virtual patient or potentially a high fidelity mannequin like is seen here. Um, so if we think about the example, right, the example that we can see here of how this mannequin, this can be used with a patient mannequin. Um, so patient mannequins are often animated, right? They're given speech capabilities through the use of um, microphones that might be connected to the human trainer sort of behind the curtain, right, or in an observation room. So for example, if, you know, Roger and Danielle were sitting around a mannequin using it, performing some kind of procedure, I might be in another room with this microphone screaming and pretending that I'm injured and providing them some kind of response that is relevant to the questions and to the things that they're asking me and to the scenario itself, right? While having that human and having me, right, using the microphone and speaking obviously provides a lot of variation and can provide the variation required for the scenario, um, it can be resource intensive. A lot of times in the training, uh, training environments, there's only one simulation manager, right, and they're there, they're running the mannequin, they're uh, making sure that the scenario is going well, they might be even grading the, the trainees, and so the last thing they want to do is have to be in another room, looking at a camera, talking into the, man into the microphone, pretending like they're injured, and having to remember the script, um, and so it's just, it's very resource intensive. There are some mannequins as well that have sort of like pre-designated um, responses, um, but again, those are very limited, right? It's kind of like what you get when you talk to Siri or Google and, um, you know, you say something and she's like, I don't, I don't understand. It's, it's kind of, a, it can be kind of along those lines too, right? Um, so using AI, the human speakers can be replaced to provide that responsive, responsiveness that is really desired and is more human-like. Um, and in order for that to happen, you can kind of see the, the uh, chart there on the left. Um, a full loop of kind of verbal communication requires that the software do a, 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 few, di a few different things. So it requires that the software have sp a speech to tech recognition that can hear what the person is, uh, is saying, the person that's being trained, what they're saying. Um, it then requires that text understand that text understanding that's generated be transformed into a model so that the computer understands what that text means, right? So it's a bunch of words on the screen, but what does that actually mean? What is the contextual understanding behind what was said or what was asked by the trainee? Um, and then the AI agent can then produce, uh, you know, a determination of how the system needs to respond based on that meaning that was that was said. Um, and then after that, a, a text-to-speech engine can then turn that desired response from the mannequin into the audio that is then heard um, out of the speakers for the trainee, right? And then that loop just kind of cycles through. Um, so taking this one step further, right, that's kind of at the, at the most basic level, but taking it one step further, intelligent speech understanding is also being used and can be leveraged to bring in more contextual information from the scenario um, to understand a little bit more um, and to respond to some more ambiguous questions, right? So, for example, you know, a lot of these mannequins have pa and virtual patients, right, have physiology models that are underlying them, right? The TC3 sim platform, um, some of these mannequins, so that you know, when you hook them up to a vital to a to a monitor, you're seeing vitals coming through, right? There's um, when you perform a an intervention, right? You give them some kind of medication or you do something like that. Uh, the physiology, the patient's physiology, changes appropriately for whatever intervention you provided. Um, and so, you know, for example, that patient physiology model could be used so that the mannequin would know how to respond to a question like, um, where do you hurt, right? Um, maybe the physiology model says that they have some kind of uh, GI distress. It indicates some kind of GI distress. And so if I were to ask, where do you hurt? You know, having that speech recognition and that under contextual understanding from the AI system underlying it might be able to say something like, um, you know, right here in my stomach or something like, in my stomach or I have a stomach ache or something like that. 
um, once the trainee performs a treatment and that treatment is recognized in the physiology model, the mannequin may also be able to understand sort of ambiguous things and respond to um, or more general questions like, does that feel better, right? I perform a treatment, I ask the mannequin, does that feel better? It, the physiology model knows, yes, they performed a treatment, um, so I'm gonna say yes, and it worked, and I'm gonna say yes, that feels better, and that's the response that automatically comes from the mannequin. And so those are a few applications that are currently being used and apply applying AI to some medical training pieces. But there's also a, a different component here that, that's kind of being talked a lot about in the literature right now. Um, and so, you know, there is an aspect that needs to be considered of how trainees, particularly clinical providers, are trained to understand AI. And this is something that, um, again, is, is being talked about a lot more recently. Um, so current medical education does not effectively prepare future physicians for the impending AI revolution in healthcare that we're going to see. Um, and there's a lot of concern that medical students, residents, fellows, they're, they're all going to face a future in which AI systems are embedded into healthcare and the clinicians have no idea, you know, and they're not educated on to understand how the systems work, um, how they really work, right? How they're, what they're capable of, what their limitations are, and how best to use them in both practice as well as in training. Um, there also may be some legal constraints on the role that these systems play in medical education and in medical operational use. And so medical, educator, med medical educators are really suggesting that there is a growing need for um, having this baked into medical school curriculum to understand AI in healthcare um, and, and how it can be used. Um, just last week, there was a presentation, one of the keynote presentations at the American Association of Gyneco Gynecologic Laparoscopy. Um, one of the keynote presentations was actually on uh, an overview of AI in healthcare. Um, and so this is becoming a lot more forward facing and, um, you know, coming from the clinical side, right? Not necessarily from the technology, technologist side, which is what we really need. Right, so just from these few applications, right, we can see that AI does have the potential to completely change how medical training is performed. Um, but with any emerging field, the medical domain, um, just as with any emerging field, the medical domain is definitely faced with some challenges um, and some considerations that need to be made as AI-based tools are being adopted. Um, and so these challenges aren't necessarily um, unique to the medical field, but they focus on how well um, AI fits into the legal and the ethical, social, um, cultural, all of those standards that surround the medical in uh, industry. And um, like I said, they're, they're very relevant to, I would say, just about, um, just about any industry. Um, so the first one, the black box versus transparency. So this really addresses the, um, the opacity of the data that is uh, underlying the systems, right? Um, and so, you know, is the instruction and the assessment that's being uh, performed and, and uh, pushed forward towards the trainee and the instructors from the AI systems, is it explainable? Um, is it clear why they scored what they scored? Is it clear why they were pushed a specific module um, from the adaptive system as opposed to another one? Um, all of that really needs to be transparent, um, especially in the sort of uh, early stages and explainable so that students and instructors have that trust with the system um, that they really need. The second thing is privacy over uh, control of, uh, privacy and control over data. Um, you know, I think we all can point to a number of examples, right, of how our data is being used now and, um, you know, how we want it to be used and we want it to be cared for. Um, and so that's no different here, right? Um, all of the patient and student data that's being uh, gathered for, for uh, use in AI and the underlying AI models for systems really need to be uh, protected and used in the right way, um, again, to make sure that people are trusting um, and willing to adopt the intelligent systems that are, that are gonna be out there. Um, so the third one is standards for use of AI in patient care and liability. Um, and so this really focuses on um, you know, the fact that this is a new technology, right? Or these are new technologies, these are new approaches that might be implemented. And so AI use really needs to be um, aligned with legal parameters that, that are in place currently for residency instruction and for patient care. Um, but also there needs to be sort of standards that uh, go across the board, across all of the organizations, um, specialties that uh, exist for 
um, implementing these kind of systems into residency and training programs and into patient care, right? Uh, so the last thing is uh, physicians learning to interpret the results, which we kind of already talked about, um, but communicating that to the patient. And this, this isn't necessarily uh, specifically related to a liability and training, um, but uh, more related to the clinical uh, interaction uh, with patients. However, this can definitely be, training can be used to help educate physicians with this. But really, you know, this, this goes back to what we talked about, what I talked about, uh, I think, in the last slide of, um, you know, or a couple slides ago, of helping physicians understand what AI is capable of, what it's not capable of, and how to interpret the results, right? So, you know, physicians really need to, and we need to find the best way to train physicians um, on how to present the AI based findings um, when if a, you know, a clinical decision support tool, for example, is being used to diagnose a patient. Um, and so we really need to figure out how to best train them to communicate that finding to a patient so that, um, you know, the patient isn't sort of concerned that an AI system is the one uh, doing their diagnosis. So, we created that special section on AI um, and on AI emerging into healthcare, right? Because AI is a hot topic. Um, there are a lot. There are a lot of other, I think, AI applications that we can we could certainly talk about. Um, maybe next year we'll expand this a little bit. Um, but we wanted to give just a, a small, um, a few examples and a few applications that are currently being used that you can kind of take away from this. Um, but there are lots of other interesting technologies that are coming into the domain that combine many of the concepts that we already discussed today. Um, and so we kind of want to wrap up the tutorial by discussing a few of these concepts um, and, how, and describe how all of these technologies are sort of um, coalescing um, to advance the field forward and how they're kind of, um, you know, working together to push training to where it needs to be. So the first concept that I'll talk a little bit about is the use of integrated surgical simulators. So I know Danielle talked about uh, the DaVinci robot, and so that's kind of what you can see here. There's actually the, the DaVinci on the left and a, a different uh, robotic uh, system on the right. Um, and so, you know, two decades previously, the medical simulation community discovered um, this really great opportunity, right, to insert a virtual world into the electronic space sort of between the physician and the patient in laparoscopic surgical systems, right? So that uh, the, the, patient, the surgeon could use that space to train and to see as this sort of virtual environment. And today, that opportunity is even greater with the use of robotics, these robotic surgical systems. Um, all of the large robotic surgical platforms have created a simulator that can be used as either an appended device, which is the one here on the left, um, and then uh, also as embedded devices, which is the one on the right. Um, and so both of these systems allow surgeons um, in training to work with the real robot. So I don't know if you can see, but the gray piece there and then the, the, part, the, both, the part that basically both of them are interacting with, that's the actual system. That's the actual surgical console that they use to perform on a patient. Um, and then the piece that, I don't know if, I don't think you can see it, but there's a piece on the back of the gray one um, that kind of hangs on it's like a backpack, right? Um, and that provides, that plugs in, and it basically takes the visual feed and puts in this virtual environment. And so the person is allowed to train with the, the actual hand pieces, the actual foot pedals, but they're working in this virtual world. Um, and then on the right, same kind of thing, except instead of that backpack on the, on the back of it, um, it's just a different sort of mode that is embedded into the system um, that's providing those visual cues and that virtual environment. Um, so yeah, both of the, both of the both of these consoles allow the surgeon to train in these uh, realistic environments with the actual hand and foot interfaces. Um, but the benefit here is that you know, although the realism of and of the VR exercises is not great, right? Like Danielle said, it's 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 still difficult to to simulate uh, real tissue in VR. Although it's not great, and it sort of still falls a little bit short of human-like tissue. Um, and the realism that's expected, the experience is, is pretty close to real, right? And it, it's good enough and um, has created, um, you know, the best piece is that it's created an opportunity to train in realistic environments without needing excised tissue, without needing to bring in a, a porcine model or a cadaver or even 
a piece of, you know, a cow heart or something like that. It's, it's uh, you know, allowing them to train that without having to worry about the issues surrounding uh, live or excised tissue. So another concept that we want to talk about is to combine is the combination of plastic and silicone models with extracted organs um, and animating that the organs that are that are extracted. Um, so the organs that we're that we're talking about might be um, cadaveric, they might be um, an animal, um, but they're both used in combination with the plastic and silicone models to create a trainer that's both realistic and reusable um, or partially reusable. Um, for for the uh, for the instructors. Um, so in the example that you kind of see here, right, um, there's this external shell that is a reusable piece that represents the anatomy of the thoracic cavity um, and provides a realistic external approach to the organ of interest. Um, but placed within the shell, I don't know if you can, yeah, I don't think you can see on the right, but in the one on the left, placed within the shell is actually excised tissue from, again, either a ca cadaver or potentially from an animal. Um, and that provides that real tissue look, feel, movement that might be expected. Um, and so the internal organs are one-time use, obviously, for surgery. Um, and so the material costs are about the same for lab training. Um, they might be a little bit more because you need some extra staff to uh, you know, prepare this system, to put it into the, into the external piece and things like that. Um, but it does help, right, because you have this re reusable piece and you don't have to use a full cadaver, for example. You can just use a small piece of tissue and put it inside this, uh, inside this kind of a, a part task trainer external shell. Um, and it allows for, again, that realistic kind of look, feel approach, um, but allows for actual tissue to be on the inside and to be doing the, the uh, procedure on the organ of interest, or the area of interest even. Um, and so another concept is um, a perfused cadaver. And so this is very similar to that animated tissue. And so also just to mention too, if I go back really quick. Um, so the animated tissue might be, so the tissue is inside of that cage, right? Um, and sometimes it doesn't actually just sit there, right? It can be hooked up to some uh, mechanical interfaces that make, for example, the heart pump um, and do things like that. Just wanna mention that real quick. So the perfused cadavers are very similar to that, but just at a much larger scale. Um, the whole body um, of a fresh cadaver, so not a, uh, uh, you know, preserved one that you might use in anatomy and physiology lab, but a, a fresh cadaver is prepared by plugging all of the, um, any major circulatory leaks that might exist. Um, and a, a transfusion pump, which you can kind of see in the diagram there, is uh, hooked up and circulates simulated non-clotting blood, uh, a non-clotting blood substitute, which is fairly inexpensive, um, throughout the entire body. Um, and so, you know, this process causes a lot of the, uh, realistic processes of the cadaver to kind of um, reignite, right? And so the heart will respond to the fluid movement um, and it'll actually look like it is pumping. Um, the tissue returns to sort of a, you know, as plump as a cadaver can be, um, a, a plump a red appearance and that kind of dry yellow and sort of jaundiced appearance that's typically there for a cadaver kind of goes away a little bit. Um, and the most important thing here, right, is that the tissue bleeds out, right? And so it is very responsive, it's very realistic, um, and uh, uh, provides the trainees with that experience that, um, you know, may be necessary, right? Um, with the most realistic experience that they could possibly have. Um, there are obviously some considerations when implementing something like this. You have to have the right kind of staff, you have to have the right kind of protocols, you obviously have to be able to handle cadaveric tissue. There are obviously some specialty equipment pieces that need to be done. Um, but it is a very interesting and uh, can be very valuable experience for trainees. Um, and so uh, I guess the last thing that we'll say on this is that, um, you know, the surgeons that use this uh, report that the tissue is almost indistinguishable from a live patient in color. Um, so the elasticity, um, the stickiness of the, of the tissue, um, and the response to the instruments. So, uh, you know, the last, the last kind of concept here is um, a fork in the road. So, you know, as we move towards having a lot of virtual experiences that are available, um, you know, is that better? Do we go 
uh, do we go down that uh, down that path because it's more realistic, it's more advanced, um, anything like that? And so Roger very kindly put the the a, an adapted version of the Robert Frost quote of you know um, of uh, you know two roads diverge in a wood, um, but instead of taking the path less traveled, we're just going to take both, right? Um, it's going to make all of the difference. Um, no, so you know all of these. We talked a lot about a lot of different applications and a lot of different technologies, and I think you know, especially the last few slides should really emphasize the fact that um, a lot of these are complementary to each other, right? And you don't have to choose just one; um, they might not all fit uh, your specific needs. And so, you know, as we move forward, the right approach very well could be um, and and should be a combination of these complementary kind of pieces that can work together um, and fit the needs of the trainees in that moment, right? And so you can see here, um, there are these sort of, it's Sindaver, they may have um, some spot, a spot here, but they're definitely at other conferences like IMSH, MHSRS, um, and so this is a, a very realistic um, uh, physical model that has some, uh, you know, realistic feeling tissue pieces, and then there's a sort of a virtual piece on the other end. And so there's no reason why these two things couldn't be used together, um, either at the same time or for different pieces of of the uh, educational continuum. Um, and so that's about that is about it. Um, and so we. Uh, just to kind of reiterate the learning objectives that we went through today. Um, and so we, like Roger said earlier, we are working our way from the bottom up um, and helping, uh, hoping that you have acquired all of these specific learning objectives through um, the discussion that we have had today um, and hopefully taking away a little bit of, uh, of uh, new knowledge um, that you can apply to, to your uh, either training or your research that you're doing. Um, and so just to kind of sum it up, you know, the tutorial has explored um, a number of major areas of medical simulation, right, including the history um, of medical simulation, proposed taxonomies of classification, learning theories that are specific to the medical training, um, human patient simulators, um, how standardized patients are used in replacement of uh, patient simulators, um, team training, surgical simulation, best practices for uh, standards and accreditation, and finally AI, um, an initial look at AI and applications and some uh, considerations and challenges. And I think that that is it. And I think that I'm, I made up for Roger's uh, uh, length here, or, or uh, height, I guess, if we want to use the analogy. I know, I'm already a short person, so I can't get much shorter.